Hi, this is Natalie Hoffman of FlyingFreeNow.com, and you're listening to the Flying Free Podcast, a support resource for women of faith looking for hope and healing from hidden emotional and spiritual abuse. Welcome to episode 12 of the Flying Free Podcast. Today, Rachel and I are going to be talking about boundaries and just everything boundaries, setting boundaries, what boundaries are, how we set them, how we cross other people's boundaries, how they cross ours. And so we're going to start by, um, first of all, hi, Rachel. Hey. I want all of you to know she's actually here. Um, (laughs) I'm going to kick off the podcast though by just explaining what boundaries are. And this is kind of a paraphrase or a spin-off of Henry Cloud and John Townsend's explanation of boundaries in their book called Guess What? Boundaries. <laughs> and that book next to the Bible, I think everyone in the whole wide world should read the book Boundaries. So, Absolutely. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what's next on your wish list, but <clears throat> if you've never read that book, that should be on your wish list. Okay. So this is kind of how I explain boundaries and it's a spinoff of how they explain it. Pretend, close your eyes and imagine that you have a house and yard with a fence around it. And, you know, think about a neighborhood. Every individual person has their very own house and yard. And who's in charge of your house and your yard? You are, right? And who's in charge of your neighbor's house and yard? They are. So what happens when a person comes over, you know, just without asking, just invites himself over into your yard and starts rearranging your rose garden? Maybe they start taking out some roses and they start planting tulips because tulips are their favorite. That that's a crossing of boundaries. And just like we would never allow that our neighbor to do that, we'd come out and we'd probably say, "Hey, you." Um, excuse me, but you can't, like, I like roses and I want roses in my garden. You can't just come in here. If you like tulips, that's groovy, but you need to go over to your garden and plant tulips in your garden, not in my garden. Okay. That's, we understand that. But when it comes to other parts of our life, we have a hard time understanding what boundaries are and how they work. And in fact, some, there are some, there's a kind of a religious teaching out there that says that, well, if you're a Christian, you can't even have boundaries. That's not even a Christian thing to do. So how, Rachel, I mean, that explanation of boundaries, does that make sense to you? And It does. I have been through a long process of um, learning at the ripe old age of 33, what this looks like, because Natalie, I was, I just want to say I was probably the least boundaried person, um, you'd ever come across. And I think it stemmed from just not having a sense of self and not knowing that I was allowed to stand up for who I was and not even knowing really who I was like having an idea, but then not living it out. And, um, so just basically allowing the world to tell me who I was and what I should do. And especially, you know, that, that manifested itself in my, um, my marriage and it was utterly unhealthy in in so many different ways. And so I, you know, a year out from, um, the divorce being final and having been separated from my husband for even longer than that, I'm still learning what this looks like. And I'm so thankful though, I get the chance to do that and learn it better late than never. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I cringe looking back at all the ways that my, my, um, lack of boundaries manifested itself in my life and what I allowed people to do and what I did with, without just out a good concept of what this looked like. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel like if you had, if you did set up boundaries that you were being mean, that that was kind of a mean thing to do? Yes. And my, identity, but part of what I thought was my identity was I was a nice person and I was a loving person. I thought that was what love was. So I couldn't, I, it was terrifying the thought of setting boundaries or set or standing up for myself because as I said, I had such a lack of self. So if someone told me that, that I, that I was mean, 
then that my entire identity was shattered um, because I was so, and it, it was people pleasing and et cetera. And it's a whole host of problems that go along with a lack of boundaries. But I, I, I would, I was just terrified um, because I didn't want to be rejected. And so there's a fear of abandonment and all that. And it's just an, it's a, it was a completely skewed view of myself and other people and, and the connection and, and the status of, of the way things were between us all. Um, instead of putting people um, next to me, you know, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all loved by God. They were all above me. And so that meant they got to just trample all over my roses every day mm-hmm. because I needed them to, I needed them to tell me that I was good. Right. So now when you think about, when you think about someone who would come into someone else's yard and just re start rearranging their flower garden. And then the person who, you know, who owns the flower garden would come out and say, please don't do that. I prefer my flower garden to look like this. Which one, when you look at it from that perspective, which person is the mean person? <laughs> well, it's the one who's using, um, you know, who's, who's trampling over someone else, you know, and using um, whatever, you know, sense of entitlement they have to go over and start messing around in someone else's property. Um, but, and so it's, it's just this, it's this dynamic where both people don't have a good sense of boundaries. What's, what's theirs, what's mine, what am I responsible for? What are they responsible for? And um, in the the case of abusive people, people who use power to lord over others and to exploit others, um, they may not care. (laughs) And they, and then they'll, you know, manipulate you in order to tell you that you shouldn't care either about what they're doing. Because if you do, you're bad. You're mean, you're cruel, you're not a good wife, et cetera. Right. So if, if you think about this in terms of mental health, I think that adult, a healthy, mentally and spiritually healthy adults would have a clear understanding of what they have responsibility for. Like this garden is my responsibility. I'm responsible for making sure that it's watered, for making sure that, you know, that I'm deadheading it and, you know, taking good care of it but also for making sure that it looks the way I, I want it to look, you know, Mm -hmm. and then other people can't come into, into my garden and take over responsibility of that. So the kind thing for me to do is to encourage people who want to come over and rearrange my garden or do weird things to it to say to them, Hey, you know what? If it looks like you really enjoy gardening, you have your own garden. And you need right. to go and learn how to take really good care of your garden. And if you like, you know, like I said before, if you like tulips and go plant tulips, you have a right. And I don't ha- just like, I don't have a right to come over into your garden and say, no, I don't like tulips. I like roses. So you don't have a right to come into my garden and say that you, that, so it's really what it is, is it's growing up into adulthood. Because when you think about it, children in some ways we we have to teach our children how to have boundaries too. Okay. So I'm not saying that children shouldn't have boundaries. They absolutely should have boundaries. And in fact, we can't, if we can't model that what having healthy boundaries is, they're going to have a hard time understanding that themselves. But overall in general, adult, you can, you can tell a healthy adult by whether or not they have healthy boundaries. And People who are well boundaried actually attract other people who have healthy boundaries. People who don't right. have healthy boundaries attract people who also don't have healthy boundaries. So if I'm the kind of person that is like you were describing, is a you know, I want everyone to love me. And so I feel like the only way they can love me is if I let them come in and do whatever they want to to my garden. Right. Then right. I'm going, what am I gonna do? I'm going to let them come over and do whatever they want to in my garden. I'm going to let them come into my house and rearrange, you know, the furniture I'm going to, you know, and, and then I lose my identity. I lose who I am. My property becomes the property of somebody else 
And we think that this is Christian. This is so not Christian. This is basically it is saying, so not Christian. No, it's basically saying, well, I'm not going to take responsibility or good stewardship of of my home and my yard. I'm going to allow other people to do that. And that's oh, it's a it's a recipe for disaster. It is, and I think it's it's. E- easy to see where um, the devil tri- twists God's word, which is what he does. So it, for the example, like it's easy, to, it's easy to think that this is the way we should be, you know, allow maybe our husband to come in and, and do all these things to our yard because we're supposed to be one flesh, right? We're supposed to become one flesh. That's the idea of marriage. And so that is such an, uh, such a, just a horrific twisting of what God's intention for people are, I think, because, um, you are supposed to be in the, the only way you can be um, that beautiful one flesh relationship. If there are two, two whole people coming together and working together and respecting each other and loving each other. And um, I think it's really important to get extremely clear on what that looks like because there is so much deception out there and it is so easy to fall into that trap, especially when we have people who are wanting to come in and, and take over our, our lives and they can use, they can twist God's word in order to, um, to justify that. Yep. There's, so I just had a thought, I've never actually thought about this before, but I was thinking about that when you were talking about the husband and wife thing, I was thinking that would be almost like, um, two houses and two yards next door to each other. And they have some shared territory. Okay. Right. So there is maybe part, maybe they share a garden or they share certain things, but they're also things that just belong to them. And the respect for that is important. The respect for the things that just belong to my husband and his respect for the things that just belong to me is there, but there's also things that we share. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, that this means that like, for example, let's just get practical here. Um, let's say that, okay, this is a real life example that my husband and I are working through. We have, we've, we bought a king size bed, but we didn't have any bedding for it. Well, I mean, we bought the sheets for it, but we didn't buy any like topping thing for it. So we have a topper that is like fits a queen size bed, but not a king size. So we've just kind of been, oh, who cares? You know, we don't care. It's just not that big of a deal. But now we're starting to think, oh, maybe we should... Like maybe we should get, he got a bonus for the new year. And we were just thinking maybe we should get a, like a bedspread or whatever you call those things that fits a king size bed, you know, so that the sides of our bed aren't showing. And, um, <laughs> and, and we could pick something out together. Right now we're using kind of a mismatch, mis, mishmash of blankets that, were, that belong to him, but they're, they don't really reflect anything of, of me or, or whatever, which is fine. But so we thought, well, let's pick out something together. Well, our taste is pretty similar. So, but we're going to work together to pick something out. Where, whereas, so that's shared territory, okay? But it wouldn't be appropriate yeah. for one or the other yeah. of us to go, well, you know what? I get to do this. This is what I'm not going to, I'm going to get to pick this out by myself. And I don't really care what you think. And you know, for neither one of us, because we're married, this, we share our bed, we share our bedroom, but let's say that I'm going to go out and buy a car for myself. And let's say that I have my own funds to do that. Who gets to choose the car that I pick for myself? I do. I do. I mean, I can ask him for help. I can say, you know, what do you think? If we have, if we're working budget stuff, then of course we have to work budget stuff. But at the end of the day, if this is going to be my car that I'm driving, I'm going to pick the one that best meets my needs. Okay. And vice versa. If he's going to be picking out a car that he's going to be driving, he's going to pick one that meets his needs, the color he likes and the style he likes and whatever. So, um, this is what you don't see in a healthy relationship. What you see in an unhealthy relationship is one partner that says, I'm going to tell you what you're going to drive. I'm going to tell you what you're going to eat. I'm going to tell you who you get to see, uh, where you get to go or not go, what you get to think or not think. That's not healthy. Yeah. And there can be different degrees of that. Sometimes 
if it's something they don't care about, they'll let you have your way and look at them. They're being really generous, right? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I was thinking in my, in my former relationship, my husband did not care about the bedding we had, but he cared about the car I drove. He was, okay. I remember car shopping with him and it was hor- horrible. Um, and he also cared about like where we would go to eat. So he would give me the choice. Um, but if it wasn't something he wanted, there was going to be consequences. Um, yeah. but he still got to, you know, he would still, you know, revel in the fact that I was getting the choice. It can be very twisted. Okay. And, yeah. um, and it's important, I think. So I'm realizing now I, in my life that, you know, the residue of that, that effect on me is that sometimes I, I can't even get in touch with what I really want because I, I want to make sure that everyone else is happy. And so I'm trying, um, you know, I'm so acquainted with that, that practice in my mind is making sure, you know, considering what other people want and what's going to make them happy. So I'm not even, I don't even realize what I, what I really want. I'm not in touch with those feelings. So I'm practicing, um, getting, getting used to that. And it's, it's sort of uncomfortable because in the past there was consequences if, if I asserted myself in that way. Mm -hmm. So Right. A long recovery process for sure. Yeah. And I think you hit I think you hit the nail on the head of one of the ways that you do know that you are making progress is when you can express your own opinion or your own thought about something without being afraid that if you get repercussions, you know, you're still gonna okay. hold your you're still yeah, exactly. You can tolerate that disapproval and you still right. you don't step back and go, Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, well, maybe my now that's not to say we can't take feedback. I'm just saying that, you know, if if you really love uh if you really love roses and someone says, I, I this happened to me, and someone says, you know, no, you don't you do you like that? I didn't know you liked that. I don't really think that you like that. I would step oh back goodness. and I would go, Well, maybe I don't. Huh. And I wasn't oh gosh, really yeah. sure what I liked or didn't like. Oh, and gosh, that brings up my, my husband used to tell me how I felt. Yeah. Yeah. What a, um, (laughs) I mean, looking back on that now, I mean, it would make me angry at the time and I would sort of joke around like, you don't get to tell me how I feel about things. And, and he would like sort of chuckle at me, like, look at the, the, um, cute little girl who thinks she can assert herself. And, but right. he, it was always like in, in the context of, well, I know you so well, you know, we'd been married since we were 18 and, um, you know, we'd sort of grown up together. He hadn't really grown up, but, um, he, <laughs> so he knew me. Oh, absolutely. He did. He knew me. Um, but it's not in a way that was, he was, he was working for my good. So he would, oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Lots <laughs> of crazy stuff. Okay. I think that's so- another way to know your healing is you look back and you're like, that was like even more so like that was really awful. (laughs) Yes, it was. It was really awful. Okay. And okay. So here's the thing though. And this was something that I, I, when the light bulb went on for me in this, it really opened up a lot of things for me as far as understanding how things worked. But when I started first learning about boundaries, I could really understand, you know, how other, I, I was allowing other people into my house and yard and I'm, I was allowing them to control it. I could right. get that. I could understand that I needed to, you know, get them out of there and I needed to take personal responsibility. But what I didn't realize was that I was actually crossing over into like my husband's yard and trying to, um, take and taking responsibility for his stuff or like even my kids crossing over into their yards and trying to take responsibility for their stuff. And that was a, or even like trying to control, you know, my family of origin, we would get together and I would try to control certain things in order to protect myself. Okay. So right. can you think of any areas in your life where you felt like you, where you look back and you go, you know, I was crossing boundaries and I had to learn how to step back and yeah, do that. all sorts of ways. Um, not only with my husband, although I, um, 
yeah, he, he, I was always trying to help him, um, to be better, to mature, um, for sure. And pointing things out definitely. And, but I think that there, um, the thing that strikes me though, is, is looking back, I would, you know, I was like mentoring other young Christian women and, or, um, you know, giving them advice. And it was always from a place of, well, you need to be doing this instead of coming alongside them and, um, and, and, and helping them see things for themselves and just being a support for them. And, and that's one of the things I cringe about, like, you know, using the Bible as um, a, a list of rules instead of a guide on grace. Right. Um, and so, and, and, and imposing that on other people and not, and so is what that does is it, it negates um, the individual responsibility of that person before God and their individual relationship and, and puts you in the place of God, which is never where we're supposed to be. Yep. And, um, and imposing something on them that is, is the opposite of what God wants for us in our relationships. We're supposed to come alongside each other. We're supposed to, you know, we're supposed to look at each other as equals and, and love one another, um, and absolutely use discernment to offer advice, but never from a place of, um, of hierarchy or judgment or, um, anything other than love really. Right. Well, and even the advice offering, I have, I now practice uh, where I don't give advice unless someone asks me for it. Yeah. Now, I'm not talking about with my kids, but I'm talking about <laughs> with ad- other adults. If they don't ask yeah. me for advice, I don't give it. Now I could say, I have some thoughts about that. Would you be interested in hearing them? Or, sure. you know, but I'm not going, but I don't jump in and offer advice, um, unless they've actually asked me for it. So I don't know. That's, it's an invitation to come over. I'm waiting for them to open the gate and invite me over. And then once they do that, then I can say, Hey, you know, these roses need some water. (laughs) Well, ultimately the choice is theirs, right? They can, they can take your advice or they can choose not to. And it has no bearing on your value as a person or um, even the value of your advice. It's totally up to them. What a novel concept. I know, I know. So, <laughs> even, so when it came to like towards the end of my other marriage, um, I started realizing how I was trying to, get my hu- trying to get my husband to change so that we could stay together. Because I had finally yeah. come to the place where if things, I knew that if things weren't going to change, I was going to be done with the marriage. So then I became yeah. very desperate to get him to change and get other people on the outside. Here I was trying to control other people too. Like, no, no, you need to come in here and you need to help me. And being very, yeah. I got very demanding that people would gather around us and fix this marriage by fixing him. Right. Right. And it, it wasn't until I finally let go, it, that's when the light bulb started going off. And I'm like, I am really trying to control this situation here. I need to let go. I need to let my husband do what he wants to do and go his way. Yeah. I need to let these people have their opinions and let them go their way. And I need to take responsibility for myself. And when mm-hmm. I did that, um, everything fell apart as far as my relationships with all of those people, because that's when I found out that they were only interested in relationship with me. If I was doing what they wanted me to do, they wanted to control me and I wanted to control them. Yes. But when I disengaged that made them angry and that was the end of all of that. It was the end of my marriage. It was the end of my going to that church. It was the end of a lot of relationships that I had. But yeah. I grew up that day. That day, it was a period yep. of time. I grew up during that period of time. I went from being Absolutely. a child to being a, an adult, standing on my own two feet. And, and it's been a great adventure ever since. It has. It's painful um, growing pains and pains from, you know, the wounds of those, those relationships that they leave in your life, but it is absolutely worth it. Cannot recommend it enough. Yeah. And, and the thing though, is it, it, I'm guessing for you, it's the same, um, as, as what I've experienced is that you start to put God where God goes 
and, and your relationship with him is more, it's more deep. It's, it's more, um, significant, it's more of a significant role in your life than it's ever played before. Even if you've been a Christian for all, most of your life, um, it's putting people where they go and putting God where he goes yes. and aligning everything according to that. I'm so glad that you brought up that point. That is absolutely right. And we take responsibility for ourselves, but we are always under that, that, um, protection and of, of that relationship with Jesus. And, um, and he is our authority and he is who we answer to. Cause yeah. that, you know, the story of the, the talents in the Bible where the right. man leaves and he leaves one guy, two talents and one guy, five and one guy, one, and they are accountable to that master, um, for what they do with, with their talents. And two of them actually invest and they, they take some risks and they end up doubling, and that's great. The, but the one hit his talents. But we are accountable. But the point is that we're not accountable to everybody else. We're just accountable to God for that. Yeah. So yep. um, that's important. And when we, well, when we, and I want to point out on that talent, on the talent parable, why why did the the person who got one talent hide it? It was out of fear. Yeah. Right. He was afraid. And I think that's something that we have to deal with in this situation when we when we're building boundaries. Is that there is that really profound fear that we've been living in and, and trusting that God is, um, is there and allowing that to give us the courage to move forward in this way. It's yep. a lot of faith, I think. Yep. Okay. So we are going this, that's the end of this episode, but this is actually just a part one of two episodes. So next week we're going to come back and we're going to talk about what happens when you do set boundaries. So what does that look like? And how do people react when we begin to set boundaries? How do they react and how does that affect our lives? And so that's, we're going to, that's going to be the topic for next week. So Rachel, thanks for joining me today. And yeah. for the rest of you, if you um, want to learn more, you can go to my website, flyingfreenow.com and you can get on my mailing list. It's, uh, it's easy to just at the top of the website, just click on that link. And that'll take you to a place where you can sign up and get on my mailing list. So you hear about the podcasts and any other articles that I write or whatever else that we're doing. I've been doing these little spoofy uh, Facebook. <laughs> I've been mocking Christian <laughs> modern Christian gurus lately. So you never know what's going to, what, what's going <laughs> to, what we're going to come up with, but all right. Okay. That's it. Fly free.